Okay, let's begin. Um, so, if you are in my class, you might have already had a brief introduction to writing systems with a two-page handout I like to use. Um, the writing systems are interesting. Uh, they Being able to see writing systems becomes really important. We'll talk about why in a moment. But they are a blend when it comes to the eight aspects of writing. They are both linguistic and technological because language is something we developed over time to make uh, to better enhance communication so it's considered a technology and we'll get more into what the technological aspect of writing counts as and how writing technologies work and linguistic writing technologies work um, in other videos connected to the technological I have some up already on YouTube um, but for writing systems let's just plow through here um, so um, with writing systems. What is it? What are writing systems? What A writing system is a way that language or communication is structured or made cognitively comprehensible for users of that system. Um, it's how our brain processes information um, or it's the systems we use so that our brains can process information. So writing systems um, happen at all levels of society. Um, they're not, uh, they happen at uh, macro levels of culture and micro levels of culture. Um, we can see writing systems develop in larger societies over periods of centuries, uh, linked to major common languages like big E English or big S Spanish or big G German um, or, or even major, um, varieties of these or dialects of these like um, American English or uh, British English or Indian English and those sorts of things um, that those are developed over a long period of time but sometimes writing systems are developed uh, even in very micro uh, micro context the way uh, even special uh, special languages you develop with your friends that kind of thing secret handshakes that mean that you belong like that's a form of communication and it's a special type of writing system um, or communication system so uh, we'll talk more about those but they just know that when we talk about writing systems they're not just what we're used to saying when we talk about languages um, or like the major languages of the world that's not the only place we see writing systems um, so we want to have a broad uh, spectrum. Um, we want to have our, our settings set very wide to understand different ways that writing systems could show up. Um, and the further you push into the linguistics, the more people might argue or, or challenge some of the way I'm presenting um, this as at what point does it become a writing system? Does it have to be, are there certain semiotic levels we have to get past before it can be classified as a writing system? I'm not going to worry about that for this, um, for this because that is way beyond anything that I'm going to be uh, anyone's need on a daily basis. So that's deep scholarship. We're not going to worry about it. So don't get too mad, Shanthan. I know, I know you're watching um, Dr. Mukherjee. Anyways, uh, moving on. So, um, so if we, why should we try to understand writing systems? Um, we, uh, understanding writing sy systems gives us insight into the logic behind language. It helps writers see rules as norms or social norms so, uh, so we can make conscious choices regarding which norms to adhere to and which ones we choose not to. Um, so first, understanding the system means that we get the logic behind the language. It makes it a lot easier to communicate. It makes it a lot easier to speak into context. Um, and so if we can, uh, if we understand the system, we can decode the system. It helps us speak into the context more effectively. It helps us translate across systems um, and it helps us identify cultural values and norms. Those are key things. But, um, but a key phrase I like to use is understanding writing systems helps us get at the logic behind the language, the logic behind how people are communicating or things are communicating um, in this environment. So keep that in mind. Um, so how do we begin seeing this? Uh, how do we look for the writing systems? Uh, we can, a lot of times when people think about languages or learning to write, uh, they think of, uh, they're, they're more likely to think of the college classroom or the school, or, or maybe it's K through 12 and you're thinking, I'm supposed to choose Spanish, French, or German, because those are the normal, um, the normal in the U.S. context uh, languages available at junior high or high school level. And so uh, maybe that's where you're used to seeing them. But when we, um, we're not talking just about the the writing systems you can get as you learn those major languages or learn an official second language through a classroom. You're interacting with different writing systems 
all the time. And so what we want to do is when we realize that we're dealing with a new system, we want to try and see that system by, no, by recognizing that it's there and it's unique and it has its own unique forms of uh, communication. We get a better, we can hone in on what the logic is behind the communication first by identifying the patterns in the language, identifying patterns in the way things are communicated within that system. Um, patterns can be found at a variety of levels. Um, it can be represented in a variety of ways. So parts of words at the morphological level uh, in sentences or phrases in the syntax of how a single line um, of text or a single line of code if you're in computer coding, but how, think, how individual pieces of meaning are organized and put together, phrases and sentences, syntax, um, or how whole sections or chunks of a document are communicated at the genre level. Um, and so the genre, um, I have other videos on each of those, so go back and look at those if you're not clear what morphology, syntax, or genre is. Um, that will really help you begin getting lenses into, like, how do I identify patterns? First, I have, to know, I have to know at what level I'm looking. So how do we build words, the logic behind the words, or the pieces of communication? Um, and I'll ha also have an application video specifically to math as a language um, in connection to this as well, so hang in there. Um, liter linguists and literacy specialists will sometimes call this process of patterning, encoding, or decoding. Um, and so when we are dealing with encoding or decoding, um, it's how we translate our individual language. Encoding is how we take the individual language of our brains into a shared language. So we have this, these semiotic ways we make meaning in our heads, and then we have to, uh, we put those into signified pieces of communication that hopefully someone else shares. Um, so uh, it's how we embed information into very symbols, sounds, scripts, images, or physicality, even the way we've, we use our body, often intentionally with the hope that someone will be able to decode the information. So we encode from our brain our individual language into a shared language of some kind using whatever uh, system we're looking for. So that's an encoding language process. Um, decoding is what our uh, what the reader would be doing. It's how we translate information um, that has already been encoded into a shared language and how we try and get it reverse engineered back into our brains, um, decoded into our brains. So, um, so one thing to be aware of is encoding is not the same as encrypting. Again, encoding is I am trying to create a message that other people can understand. I'm using all the, I'm using the language of this system because I have um, a reason for using that system and I'm trying to connect with someone who knows that system. Or it's the only system I know to get this message out and hopefully other people will be able to um, do what they need to to get my, to, to decode my information. So encoding, sh my individual language into the shared language. Um, decoding, taking from the shared language as a reader. Um, into their own, their new private, their private language or personal language or individual language resources and try to decode. Okay. Um, so this will be, a, I'll, I wish I had more well developed slides. I'll apologize now. But for what it is, let's talk through some common types of writing systems. There are plenty of other combinations in here. I'm just giving you kind of the big lenses um, as you try and categorize and to help you better understand how uh, things could be communicated. So first, um, we've got somatic or physical languages, finger counting, posturing, ASL. So um, one thing I like to ask my classes to do is how high can you count with one pass on your fingers. Um, and most people will say, I can get to 10 in one pass because I have 10 fingers. I go and I count up. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, there are other ways to count on uh, on your hands. Uh, ASLU has its own thing, and uh, so if you know that, you can go have fun looking it up or just think of that as well. Uh, I like to think um, way back in ancient Mesopotamia, um, <laughs> they used to count, uh, there were different types of counting systems. And so what they would do is they would actually use their hands, they'd use one hand to keep track of um, sets of 12, and so they'd use your thumb and go one, they'd use, what is it, per knuckle, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then they'd come over here and go, okay, that's one set of 12. And so you could get 60 on this hand showing sets of 12, and then you could get up, and then you could get all the way up to another set of 12 over here. So if you held up this, that'd be 72. Um, so if someone's like, uh, if someone's yelling from the beach and you've been out, um, you know, you're out on the, uh, on the, Euphrates or the Nile or something like that and someone yells how many fish did you catch today we're hungry and you've been out at um, you know 
and sweating and your, your voice is kind of crackly. You don't think you can project. You just hold up. You hold up that many, and it would be 48 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so it would be 48 plus 8, 56 fish. Um, so you wave that at them, and they're like, yay, the whole family gets to eat. Um, so that's somatic language. It's physical. Um, it's finger counting. It's po sometimes when we talk about body language or posturing. Um, there are so many things um, that are kind of pseudoscience connected to that. But, you know, it's like, does this person like me? If, well, if they cross their legs towards you. So all these different ways that physical language or body language could be used. But that's, so, that's a somatic writing system or somatic communication system, depending on how you define writing. Someone's going to get mad at me. Oh, well. Um, but uh, beyond that, we've got standard alphabetic text, alpha, beta. Um, these are linked to the Roman and Greek alphabetic systems. Um, and so A to Z or some other variants. Um, um, there are Cyrillic alphabets and things like that um, and whatnot. Uh, then, um, so that's pretty standard alphabetic, um, just you have letters that represent things. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. Phonographic, if you pull, if you remember how we talked about morphology, uh, we can pull apart this word. The ick at the end is just a modifier to say what part of speech it is. Um, and so this, that this is an adjective um, for the most part, uh, or a modifier of some kind. Um, then we have phono and we have graph, or graph, and those come from the root word for phono, which is like sound, um, and like our phone. And then we have graph or graphia, which comes from the same root that we get graffiti from. And so that means uh, it's actually a root word for writing. Graphia means to carve or scratch out, uh, presumably on a clay tablet or wax, uh, wax tablet or something like that. Um, or into stone. So, so when we look at phonographic systems, they are written or carved sounds. So they're sound-based systems, not sound-based systems, um, if you have a nice stereo system. Um, so sound-based systems. Um, these are carved out sounds. So it means that when we look at the words on the page, um, they, are, um, they are directly connected to how they're spoken. So if uh, they read phonetically. Um, so uh, so someone can read them, and if they know how to pronounce each letter, they may not know what any of it means, but if they can pronounce each letter, they can recognize by how it sounds when they speak it, is kind of the idea. So phonographic is carved out sounds. Phonological is um, when ideas, the logical is uh, connected to logos, so we'll talk again with logographic, um, but it, the logical is when the ideas are represented in sound form. Um, and then we have pictographic, which is carved out pictures. Um, and, the, and so that is, um, yeah, so that's just carved out pictures. So this would be like emojis or Egyptian hieroglyphics and that sort of thing where um, the symbol uh, doesn't necessarily correlate with sound, but it looks like what it is. So a lion that is the symbol of a lion, someone draws a lion to mean lion. Um, someone draws a car to mean car. Um, so we'll talk about that in comparison to others in a minute. Um, and then logographic is carved out ideas. Um, so because we've got the graphia, we've got that kind of sense of carving. But logo or logos, um, a lot of times we hear it connected to appeals, Greek appeals like logic. Um, but there's a, there's a deeper texture to what logos means um, in the Greek. And it has the sense of something something intangible or something kind of mental or ephemeral um, this the, an idea made more concrete and so uh, you know an example of this if you're familiar with biblical texts at all um, there's uh, in the gospel of John it starts out in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us um, and so that idea the word forward in the Greek of that text is logos. And so there's this sense that there's this um, otherworldly or, or something beyond the physical realm, in this case, heavenly realm, um, that is being made tangible, being made concrete. It says the logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. So a logographic thing is, the, is a carved out idea. So there's a little bit of a texture to this logo. It's not like a business logo, though there's some comparison here you could make because we're talking about writing systems. But logographic um, writing is um, carved out ideas. So this would be instead of a picture, if you had a heart, well it's not like a, a an actual cardioid heart in my chest. It doesn't have two atriums and two ventricles, you know, that kind of thing. It has you know, if I use a heart emoji, I usually mean it to say I love something, right? So that symbolic metaphorical sense of an idea put into something a bit more concrete 
um, is an, a logographic or ideographic sometimes, um, depending on who you talk to, uh, system. So we've got pictographic systems, which are almost one for one correlation. I draw a car, I mean a car, I draw a cat, I mean a cat, I draw a line, I mean a line, versus logographic, which is I want to communicate the sense of courage or bravery, so I draw a line, that kind of thing. Um, and then we've got numerical number-based systems. I'll talk more about that with uh, math. Um, I am gonna do videos on math, uh, on math as a language, and then applying language to chemistry or applying language and writing systems and rhetorical principles to chemistry and sciences as well. So with that, um, we'll, we'll stop here and there'll be other videos kind of in this series.